let's start uh, the afternoon off with uh, Vanessa Schumacher and Matteo Tonignali. Um, Vanessa Schumacher leads a digital pathology team in the development of early biomarkers for oncology at Pratt, uh, one of Roche's independent R&D units. She was trained as a veterinary pathologist at the University of Connecticut and Cornell, and she is now leveraging the power of digital pathology to bring the best therapies to patients. Also, we will um, hear Matteo Toninali, who is the COO of Visium, a very successful young and growing Swiss company that develops machine learning solutions for a variety of industry sectors such as energy, manufacturing, logistics, and of course healthcare. Before he joined Visium full-time in 2020, Matteo obtained his PhD in machine learning and computational biology from ETH Zurich, where he developed machine learning methods for graph structured data and explored the genotype-phenotype relationship in bioinformatics using big data and machine learning. Um, so their joint talk is called Boosting Digital Pathology with Machine Learning, and Vanessa will start. Take it away. Thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to present here today. Today, Matteo and I will be sharing an example of how we use machine learning to help augment and support pathologist assessments. And we'll also speak about the broader application of how machine learning can have an impact in digital pathology, and in turn, how that could have an impact in the whole research and development value chain. So, Let's start off with an introduction to what digital pathology is for those that you may, that may not know. Maybe you consider pathology to be a very historical discipline that is based on manual inspection of slides where the pathologists will integrate what they see in the morphologic patterns with uh, their integrative assessments from other aspects of the patient, and then to come up with a diagnosis. And this, this field has really undergone a huge revolution because of the broad availability of whole slide images in the first instance, and also now by applying machine learning models. So we're moving from a more manual approach to moving toward centralized repositories of whole slide images and data to move toward a more scalable and augmented processing to support pathologists. If we think about pathology, many may consider that to be a very diagnostic discipline, but in fact, pathology has a huge impact across the drug development value chain, starting from very early on in target assessment, choosing targets that we want to develop therapies for, all the way through the clinical studies and beyond. It starts off with a good understanding of the disease and understanding of which targets may be appropriate to develop therapies for. Preclinical assessments may include looking at efficacy or safety or prevalence in preclinical models or in real world samples. Translational pathology is really taking the step of bridging our research bench work into medical applications. And then of course we have clinical trials where we try to see if we can uh, prove our hypotheses about how a particular compound might work in the patient setting. Biomarkers are an important part, not just of clinical trials, but also in all the steps before and all the steps after. Tissue-based biomarkers are assessed by pathologists and can be used to help inform on how a treatment may be working or what might be some potential markers of toxicity in the, treat in the patient as well. And this can in turn inform on personalized medicine approaches, uh, including companion diagnostics. So as you can see, pathology has quite an impact and the digitalization of pathology and the benefits that could bring could therefore have a very broad impact in how we develop uh, and research medicines. Our vision for digital pathology is that it enables us to bring safe, and effective therapies to patients faster. So let's look at a practical example. Here in this case, we'll show you an example of a necessary step in research and development that we have tackled with the application of machine learning. 
Toxicology studies are an essential step in preclinical assessments where we're looking at the potential safety profile of a compound before we go into clinical trials. So in this case, we usually test a compound at different doses and a control molecule. And we are using an animal model to look and see if there could be any adverse effects of that compound. So the readouts that the pathologist will get in hands are some readouts from laboratory tests, maybe some genomic assessments, also the whole slide images or the slides from multiple organs uh, from the animals in the study. The pathologist integrates all of those information, different pieces of information into an adversity assessment. They help to determine what could be potential risks associated with the molecule do we have a good therapeutic window? How is the risk benefit ratio? And are these risks that we identify in the preclinical models potentially translatable to human? And that helps us make an informed decision moving into phase one. What are the challenges of this step? So as I mentioned, this is a very key step in the development process. It is labor and time intensive. It requires a highly skilled and specialized pathologist to look at all of the study slides. And it also entails a peer review process. That means the second pathologist will also look at a portion of the slides. In addition, we have many slides to evaluate. It of course varies depending on the specific study, but we can say for our estimation here about 1600 whole slide images per study. And these images are consisting of many organs. So in general, around 35 organs per animal. And these tissues are complex. And maybe more importantly, the lesions we're looking for are also complex and could also be very subtle. And this brings us to our last point is that most of the tissues a toxicologic pathology just looks at are normal. And nonetheless, as the lesions can be subtle and important lesions can be subtle, they need to spend a lot of time very carefully looking at all of the slides in the study. So that means that the pathologists are spending most of their time looking at normal slides that are not bringing the key information about the toxicity mechanisms or potential uh, toxicity therapeutic window of the compound. So now I'm going to hand it over to Mateo, who's going to tell you a little bit more about how we tackled this challenge. So, so when Vanessa first introduced us to these challenges, she had a clear idea in mind, namely using machine learning and the wealth of data collected throughout the Digital Pathology Initiative at Roche to solve these issues. We therefore started working on a solution together. We envisioned the solution to streamline toxicologic pathology assessments. The tool is designed to assign lesion probabilities to each of the slides to screen out slides that contain no lesions, the healthy ones, which constitute the majority of slides as highlighted by Vanessa, and to provide an interpretable heat map for the remaining slides to guide downstream discussions between pathologists of where potential lesions could be located in the images. All in all, this allows pathologists to focus their time on critical decision making. Now, how do we translate this into a proper machine learning um, scenario? The learning task at hand is highly complex for three main reasons. First, we're talking about massive images with up to billions of pixels. Unlike other areas of digital pathology, such as oncology, where we're working with biopsies, here we have slice, slides with whole organs in, in them. Therefore, we need to assess a much larger quantity of tissue. Second, we only have single labels for each of these slides. Uh, we do not know where the lesions are. We only know if there is a lesion or if there aren't any. This, uh, in combination with the fact that lesions come in all shapes and sizes, uh, makes the, the, the task particularly challenging. In fact, lesions can be very focal and localized at one area in the slide or diffuse and cover thousands of pixels. Lastly, we have slides that come from a wide variety of studies which differ in protocols that were used and in the acquisition uh, timeline. 
This results in a high variability in the color uh, of uh, the input slides, as you can see in some of these examples. And this has implications at the modeling level, uh, which brings in high risks of overfitting, as we'll discuss later. Now, these three challenges, as mentioned, make the task particularly challenging, and we decided to tackle them uh, via uh, the following approach. So to tackle the first issue of large images and the second one of single labels, we relied on the so-called multiple instance learning framework, which is a gold standard, uh, very well used framework in digital pathology for other applications. Uh, and the framework decomposes the image into tiles that are then fed into a model, can be any sort of convolutional neural network, that assigns a probability of containing a lesion to each of the small tiles. And these probabilities are then aggregated to obtain a final score for the whole slide image. Now, the aggregation scheme at the end uh, of this process is oftentimes very simple. It can be the average over the top five predictions or simply taking the maximum value across those tiles. To tackle the third issue, we rely uh, on heavy uh, color normalization and strong color augmentation. This way, the model will not focus on specific uh, details that are related to a study, such as the color, and instead learn more general features about the lesions that characterize them and that can be generalizable and extendable to new type of images. Now, as you can imagine, uh, the, the model is left with the task of going through this massive image, going through each one of these small tiles, and pick up the ones that constitute a lesion. This is like finding a, a needle in a haystack. And um, in our case, we are interested in finding all the lesions. We are not um, looking for only the top ones and the most obvious ones, especially because the least obvious lesions are the ones which carry the, more, the most valuable information from a pathological perspective. That's why the multiple instance learning framework, which we applied in the first step, is good for certain applications, but for our case, we're, we're looking at these big organ slices, it reaches certain limitations. In particular, the aggregation scheme uh, is just too simple to deal with the complexity that we find across the entire image and only focuses on the most obvious lesions. We therefore went back to the design table and tried to come up with a model that would account for the entire image and uh, go beyond simple probability pooling. To do so, you may be familiar with um, a new class of models that have recently uh, outperformed all benchmarks in natural language processing and reached a tremendous performance there. We've decided uh, to apply this to our setting. So transformers architectures are a new class of neural networks that have also been recently applied to images. And in our particular case, we still work with the whole slide image that is decomposed into tiles. We then learn embeddings for each of the tiles, but instead of simply taking the top five or top 10 tiles, we actually feed all the tiles embeddings into a transformer network to learn a final global embedding that represents the full slide that is then used for the prediction of uh, normal or abnormal containing lesions or not. The model is then trained end-to-end, -end, which allows us uh, to consider the organ as a whole, uh, as mentioned before. And this is uh, very beneficial in the case of uh, our particular problem. We see this as well from a performance perspective. Here, we compare the performance of our model uh, and the multiple instance learning baseline uh, trained on our full data set of around 1,400 uh, whole slide images. We see that there is a massive improvement of almost 21% um, on the area under the rock curve, which is made available thanks to this holistic consideration of uh, the slide. Uh, the, uh, just a side note here, the task that we're dealing with is very different from the typical oncology tasks um, that we encounter in digital pathology, um, where the uh, cancer detection task is aimed at selecting very specific uh, features and recognizing uh, very um, localized and specific features, while our task aims at, at trying to find a wide variety of lesions across the slides. 
which makes it uh, slightly um, more complex from a learning perspective. And therefore, a 90.6% AU rock is um, very competitive for these uh, mechanisms. In addition to that, the attention mechanism that we have in our transformer model can be used to extend it and account for many other inputs. We could potentially include the location of the tiles on the slide, but also includes additional um, sources of, uh, of data, such as genomics information of the animals, potentially. But more interestingly, this attention mechanism can, of course, uh, be used to interpret the model's prediction. And uh, the attention is, can be seen as the relative importance that the model gives at each tile on the image, we can then take these values, smooth them out, and overlay them with the original image to provide a heat map to guide downstream discussions. Now, looking forward, we uh, will now deploy this solution for pathologists to have access to the predictions. And we will try to um, also go beyond and, and see a few examples of where these type of techniques can be used beyond preclinical studies. So a quick word about how we plan to do so. We, we're going to present the predictions via a user interface to pathologists. This will result in uh, several benefits, such as improved decision making and accelerated turnaround time for studies. And more interestingly, the, 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 the techniques that we developed here can, we, can be very much used for other use cases. And I'll hand it back to Vanessa for her to give you an outlook. Thanks, Matteo. So today we shared one example from the preclinical side to demonstrate the value of machine learning in digital pathology. However, of course, there is many broader and very exciting deep learning applications in pathology. So as I mentioned in the beginning, pathology has impact in different, different parts of the drug discovery and development value chain. So we are interested in extracting, for example, a new class of biomarkers from routinely available histology slides, because in many studies, an H&E histology slide is often available. And what we can do is use machine learning to identify new, so either subvisual or even human interpretable biomarkers that can inform us and help us to be more predictive. So to understand, uh, would this particular patient be rather sensitive or resistant, uh, would, would this disease be sensitive or resistant to a particular therapy? We also have the potential then, if we can, the more we can leverage from an h and &E slide, of course, that gives us broader potential to impact preclinical and clinical workflows as well. Using any biomarkers that we define by applying of these models, we can then help use those biomarkers to inform on clinical trial design, um, to help us to better predict treatment response, and then also use those to inform on precision medicine strategies. Using whole slide image-based prediction, for example, of genetic mutations are, is a current very hot topic, a hot field of research. Also predicting certain features with survival. And all of these, this information can eventually feed into companion diagnostics, and personalized treatment strategies. So this is a very active field of research and there's always very exciting uh, publications coming out every day, <laughs> it seems about this topic. And I think one of the reasons that this is such an active area of research is because of the huge impact this can have. So with that, we will close for questions, but first I want to give a big thank you for all of the individuals the heroes that made this possible. It was definitely not going to be possible without a great uh, extent of collaboration and um, a real good team spirit between our two groups. So thank you for that. Thank you, Vanessa and Matteo. Um, so we indeed have quite, quite a list of questions here. I will start with the first one um, by Marco Parillo. Um, this, I would say, goes probably to Vanessa um, and is quite rush specific, so you can choose which part you want to uh, respond to. Uh, he asks, could we apply this model to the substance databases at Roche to accelerate the choice of high potential substances for drug development? In other words, how much can this model accelerate drug development? 
So I, I will give a general um, answer to that question. And I think one of the goals and potentially a huge, yeah, a huge area of potential is, of course, integration of different types of models um, and and putting them together, as, as Matteo also mentioned, using other sources of data other than digital pathology images. I, I think this is a huge area of potential. And for sure, I think, of course, anything needs to be tested and tried out. But I, I think that seems like a very exciting area of research that we could we could look into. Okay, thank you. Maybe Matteo also wants to, to have a question and add on to that. Um, no, I, you said it all. I think that uh, incorporating additional data sources is really like, the natural next step uh, to be able to bring these, uh, these sort of predictions uh, and, and to make uh, the, the work more predictive around uh, the, the, the compound selection as well. So yes, uh, cl clinical uh, uh, pathology information or other uh, hematology information from uh, from the animals and so on so yeah and maybe just to feed on so I guess this is this is more the concept of not just looking forward so what can we predict but also looking back right so what uh, what can we do better next time and I think that's a very very relevant point that the that the colleague brought up thanks for the question thank you um, one that pertains a little bit more about the, the um, relationship between research institutions and companies um, comes from uh, Juliane Klatt. Um, this is also um, uh, directed to Vanessa, but I'm sure M Matteo has something to say about this too. Um, so Visium is an AI consulting firm uh, in contrast to an academic machine learning AI research group. Roche has experience in col collaborating with both. If you compare both types of collaboration, what would you say are the main advantages, disadvantages of either? Yeah, I, I think I wouldn't speak to advantages or disadvantages, just I think in this field, of course, it it's all goes down to fit of you know, the scientific question in the beginning that's going to be posed and then looking for the collaborator that is going to be the, the one that, that is the best fit for helping to bring this forward and where there's a synergy there. I think that's the most important aspect rather than saying, um, you know, specific type of institution. That's what I would say from my side. Maybe Matteo. Um, I think both modes of uh, collaboration have, uh, have their uh, advantages, uh, of course, uh, as Vanessa pointed out, it really depends on the question that uh, we're trying to answer. Uh, perhaps from a, a, a technical standpoint, more, and this is more particular to machine learning and, and AI in general, the advances are, are so fast that it's important to find people that are specialized in the specific problem that, uh, that we're focusing on, um, since the field as a whole moves forward at a breakneck uh, speed. Yeah, this actually um, leads me to, to a question I had. Um, so like you said, the field, the machine learning field uh, moves very, very fast. And so I was wondering how, how hard is it as a company to keep up with the new models, the new state of the art, um, and then make the decision to, to use a new model to try it out in a project. So that, because you need to have at least an inkling of whether something could work or not. How, how do you come to this decision whether it's worthwhile to, to use a new model? I would say it's a combination of, well, of course, keeping up to date with what's happening. And, and for that, we have a whole series of initiative internally uh, within Visium, uh, but also that is shared across the general community. As you know, machine learning is a very open community, so th th there's not too many um, blocking uh, issues for, for certain papers, except uh, for, in, on certain uh, exceptions. Uh, but uh, th that's one part, so we have to, to keep up with, uh, with the literature and with what's uh, coming up. A and the second part is also focused on the, uh, on the project per se. So if we know that uh, we'll reach uh, a certain result with, uh, with a new technique, of course, we're going to go for it. Uh, but if we know that the improvement will only be very marginal, uh, there's no business interest in, in, in pursuing this. So it, it's really a balance between uh, the, the, the risk and the, and the benefits, a bit like uh, 
uh, what we observe in, in preclinical studies too. Okay, thanks. So um, we have one last question by, by Damien. Um, can you comment on the difficulties to apply these methods to different tissues? Can models leverage knowledge extracted from one tissue to be used in another? Yes, so uh, we indeed explored this. So we, we worked mostly with, with livers and then we tried to, uh, uh, to transfer the models onto kidneys. And the, the lesion types that you observe in the different tissues are highly different. Vanessa can, can tell you more about that, but uh, the, there's a wide variety of, of lesions that can be observed. And from a machine learning perspective, the big benefit, of course, is to have uh, sort of a, a feature extractor, extractor that works well with histopathological images. Now, the transfer per se, uh, out of the box, a model trained on livers will not work mm. to detect lesions on kidneys, uh, but it allows for, of course, using much fewer images on uh, new organs. I don't know if, uh, Vanessa, you want to add anything uh, there? No, I can just say that that's, that's a challenge of being a pathologist, and that's also a challenge we have here, because this is going, obviously our end goal is to apply across all of the organs, so this is what we're looking into now, and as Matteo said, it's, it's maybe not going to work out of the box, especially if you're considering very different appearing organs that might have different types of processes going on. Makes sense. All right, so thank you again, uh, Matteo and Vanessa. It was a very interesting discussion and uh, a great talk, a great joint talk. <laughs>